That's a little bit above 2008. 2008, there was 4.12 million transactions. So we're not too far away from 2008 numbers in terms of the number of transactions in the country. The people getting out of the business just never really were in the business. We were scared because we didn't know if our family was going to die, if we were going to die, if we were, if, if, if the planet was even going to exist. We're going to, we're about to have the largest real estate surge that we've ever seen. And here is why. And the longer that retraction lasts, the bigger the explosion is, the bigger the resurgence is on the back end. Affordability was amazing for the last decade. They're going to be more than happy to list their home and buy their dream home for, you know, a percent or so less than, than they're in right now. So it's going to have the opposite effect later. All these leads that I'm telling you are free are the same quality of leads that people spend thousands of dollars for. Okay, cool. Hey, yeah, good good to be here. Um, how many people are in the world? Can you see that? Uh, I've got about 16 in the world, and okay. we have some on Workplace Chat, and we have some in our Google Meet, so we're kind of spread out. Nice, nice. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, no, I've uh, been in real estate for one years, um, mostly as a real estate agent. Um, at this point, I do mostly investing, buying and holding, um, building the brokerage, um, traveling, speaking, writing books, creating content, um, trying to coach agents. So back in 2017, I became the first completely free real estate coach in the industry. I did that to leverage my success in real estate to build a massive brand that I could then leverage to build bit massive businesses. So it was kind of a uh, risky move, and um, but it's paid off really well. Um, I enjoy what I do. I, uh, I have a lot of time to spend with the family. Um, I have one employee, which is my real estate assistant that kind of handles everything on the back end. I'm into sales, mortgage, coaching, investing, and building the brokerage, of course. So yeah, no, it, it's been a roller coaster. And uh, what I'm really good at is helping agents understand that there's always opportunity in the market. Right now is actually the greatest opportunity I've ever seen. And it's really the best time to get in the business and really build it. Um, we can get into whatever you guys want to get into. I asked, Car Carmen asked me to speak and I said, sure. Um, I'm, I'm more than open to doing kind of a Q&A style situation. I didn't want to get into me rambling about you know, whatever subject I thought you guys might want to hear about, I would much rather hear what questions you have, what struggles you guys are having in your business um, so that I can give you my two cents and hopefully help you maybe visualize a more efficient business and um, get more done in less time and, you know, really look at this for what it is. As I said, the greatest opportunity we've ever seen. So yeah, happy to dive into whatever questions you guys have today. You may want to go first. I know I have a question. So when you say it's the best opportunity you've ever seen, I know there's been thousands of real estate agents leave the business in droves lately. Um, what do you, what do you see as the opportunistic opportunity here and why so many other people don't see it that way and are getting out of the business? Well, it's a good question, but it's totally normal though, because I mean, the bottom line is this business is a lot harder than people think it is. So they get in with um, false expectations. And then when they realize how hard it really is, then, you know, a lot of people drop out. And that that actually gets magnified um, whenever the market shifts. So right now we're looking at 4.2, 4.3 million transactions this year in the country. And um, that's pretty much, that's a little bit above 2008. 2008, there was 4.12 million transactions. So we're not too far away from 2008 numbers in terms of the number of transactions in the country. So this is, a, this is as slow as it gets. Now there's a lot, there are some entities out there who are projecting that we could dip into the 3 million, the high 3 millions or even lower. And that's a possibility, anything's a possibility. But we are, I mean, in my opinion, we're, this is about as slow as it's gonna be. And anybody who is keeping their head above water right now is really going to see an explosion in their business as the market resurges. But this is totally normal for when the market shifts, all the people that, you know, weren't making it when the market was great kind of tend to get out of the business. We saw a very massive surge of agents come in, you know, through the pandemic when people were sitting at their houses with nothing to do. It's 300 bucks to take your real estate course, um, get rich quick kind of thing. So that this is, 
totally normal. The people getting out of the business just never really were in the business. Um, and that really doesn't matter to, to any of us. The, the real opportunity is, I mean, let's just take it back. I could tell you a bunch of different um, time. I could give you a, a, a lot of different you know points in time. I'll just give you one, for example, when we were all uh, quarantined, when we were all, you know, the economy was shut down and we were told to stay in our houses. That was uh, mid-March to May 1st in 2020. You know, what was going through our heads at that point? Well, we were scared because we didn't know if our family was going to die, if we were going to die, if we were, if, if, if the planet was even going to exist, if, uh, you know, if, if we were even going to have jobs, we, there was a lot of uncertainty. That was a very fearful time during that time. There's a video on YouTube that I put out April 20th, I believe it was, when we were still shut down. And I said simply, we're gonna we're about to have the largest real estate surge that we've ever seen and here is why and i did a video about it that's still on youtube that was put out while we were shut down the economy was completely shut down most people have this fear of uncertainty and don't know what's happening but it was very clear to me what was about to happen and what did happen well we saw one of the largest real estate surges that we've ever seen how did i see that coming well it's an educated guess I was always a really good test taker, but it's not hard for me to see what's going to happen in the market over the next, say, six months. It's really hard to predict a year out, two years out, five years out. But over the next two, three, four, five, six months, unless something catastrophic happens, it's really easy to see what direction the market's going in. The market moves really slow. And during that shutdown, when I saw the retraction of transactions, okay, Every time I see a retraction of transactions, I know that there is pent up demand brewing. And the longer that retraction lasts, the bigger the explosion is, the bigger the resurgence is on the back end. Same thing here. You know, we're seeing this real massive, you know, I think we're down 20% transactions this year, year over year so far. Um, that's a massive retraction. And, and by the way, that was the same amount that we were down during that shutdown we had 20 percent last transactions and 20 percent last pending deals during that 45 day economic shutdown when i saw that 20 percent less transactions and pending deals i said oh my gosh we're about to see this incredible surge now the surge that happened last way longer than i thought it would um, and that was due to the stimulus and you know the lower interest rates and you know supply and demand and everything like that but what i'm seeing right now um and, and i could give you a lot more a lot more points you know like back in december i said this is the bottom for prices well the bottom actually hit late january and we're up on the year um you know from january to now we're up getting close to about 10 percent. we're about to go positive year over year during the time that we hit an all-time high last year Last year, we hit all times high in June, and we're about to hit positive year over year. Zillow already said we're positive year over year in May. We were up 0.9%, basically 1% year over year from May to May. We're going to see the other entities fall in line. It's going to be like dominoes. We're going to see Redfin. We're going to see Fannie Mae, Realtor.com, NAR. We're going to see all of them come out and say we're positive year over year during a time where 12 months ago, we were at an all-time high, which means what? which means we're about to hit all time highs. Now this is nationally, right? Every market's local. And of course there are markets that are still down a little here and there, but every single market I look at, look at is up from the bottom, which happens sometime depending on the market in January or February, something like that. But nevertheless, I'm saying all that to say this, that the retraction of transactions that we see right now, coupled with the historic we've never had this low of inventory in the month of may and june it's never happened right never been this low even in the craziest years we've had over the past couple of years where we're like oh there's no inventory it's even lower right this second and historic demand if you go back and look at i mean if you zonda did a survey where 98 percent of millennials want to become homeowners Let's say that off, that's off. Let's say it's 80%, 85, 90, whatever. A lot of them, okay? There's 72 million millennials. Well, if you go back and look, 1990 birth rates, we had a massive spike, not just a little bump, but like a massive spike that lasts for 16 years after that. 
And that literally represents, that's 33 years ago. Okay, if you look at the average age of a first time home buyer, last year was 36, the year before it was 33. So let's just say it's between 33 and 36 years old. So we have the most by far 33 year olds, people turning 30, 33 this year, who will be 34 next year, 35 next year, then another group turning 33 next year. We, in decades, we haven't seen the amount of people who want to become homeowners who are in their prime buying years. This is actually happening right now as we speak. And we don't even know it because all of this is being suppressed by mortgage rates. We have that happening, which is unprecedented. We've got people that are sitting in their house who won't sell because mortgage rates are so high and they're sitting on such low uh, mortgage rates currently that won't sell, that literally hate their home. <laughs> and every single day that goes by, they want to move more and more and more. And at some point, there, there's going to be a line drawn. I don't know if it's when mortgage rates get down to 5% or 55 or there's going to be something that incentivizes people that are sitting on these low rates to, to go and sell those properties. Um, and so there's just this, you know, immigrants, right? People coming in here, you know, from other countries, like they're renting, which makes property values go up because now there's, you know, rent goes up. There's a massive amount of multifamily being built right now. Um, there's a lot of things happening right this second in the market that's just really incredibly positive for, for the market, um, especially when it comes to prices. The one negative place in the market, I feel, is that there are a lot of first-time home buyers being priced out of the market. Um, how, you know, Affordable housing is kind of going to the wayside. We're you know, that this is a, this is a growing concern, but I'll tell you this, a lot of people that talk about unaffordability and how, you know, how high mortgage payments are and how, you know, something's got to give. Well, uh, I'll just say this to you. And that is that if you look at a graph and you look at mortgage payments and you, you look at the, you, you adjust that graph to uh, inflation, uh, you'll see that, and, and, and if you look at mortgage payments, if you look at percentage of people's household incomes that goes towards mortgage payments, um, if you look at that data, you'll see that back in the late 80s and 90s and early 2000s, okay, we were at this, let's just call it normal level, and then we dipped down after 2008 for about a decade. It was ridiculously low for like affordability was amazing for the last decade. And if you look at that graph, you realize how spoiled we've been over the last 10 years and how if you look at the graph and where it is now compared to the early 2000s, 90s, late 80s, you'll see that we're just right in line with the 90s, 80s, early 2000s. We're just kind of getting back to normal. And a lot of people are complaining about this. I can't afford a house and um you know this is crazy and you know people are barely been well yeah but the thing is is that's because you grew accustomed to the way it's been over the last 10 years which was completely unrealistic there's never been a time where prices went down 50 percent and mortgage rates were down into the two percent range never and so you were spoiled by that and now you thought that was the new norm but it wasn't now we're getting back to normal that was a moment in history that we should have all taken more advantage of than we have, but you can't go back. But we can realize that this is the new norm. I saw a video um, of a newscast in 1981, and it was in Canada, and they talked about how mortgage rates were up into the 17 range, 18 range, and it had been that way for about a year, and they got down into the 15 range, and it was like an atomic bomb. Buyers just came out of nowhere. And they interviewed a few of those buyers. And what the buyers said was, is that, you know what? Um, if you need a house, you can't, you can't get lower interest rates. You have to deal with the interest rates that you have. And um, what happened was, is those, those buyers just grew accustomed to higher mortgage rates. And that's, I think we're going through a transition period where we're getting back to normal, where, you know, normal uh, affordability from the late eighties, nineties and early two thousands. It's just going to take us a little time for the you know consumers to kind of grow accustomed to the fact that you know we're going to be in this five to seven percent mortgage rate for a while and um, prices are going to go higher 
<laughs> the prices are going to continue to go higher. So uh, I'll end that part of the market with this. Same reason why sellers won't list their property um, right now because they're sitting on low interest rates. What do you think that the people who are buying at today's six and a half percent rates are going to do in two to three years when rates are five and a half and they want to upgrade, right? They're going to be more than happy to list their home and buy their dream home for, you know, a percent or so less than, than they're in right now. So it's going to have the opposite effect later. Realize that right now there's lower inventory because we're 23% less new listings this year compared to last year because sellers don't want to sell because we're sitting on low interest rates. That's, that's going to be opposite later when people that are buying into these six and a half and 7% rates can buy into a five and a half rate in two to three years. And they're going to be happy to list and that's going to help inventory. This is going to take several years to play out um, and inventory to, to settle out. And in the meantime, prices are going to continue to go up because of the reasons of the pent up demand that I've, I've said. Builders are really racking up right now, like because there's no existing homes are going on the market, basically. And so but there's all this demand. So this is creating a very, very uh, advantageous uh, opportunity for home builders. And we saw that in the last home builder report, right? It was a, it was expected to be a 1.3 million on an annually adjusted basis home starts for the year. But what did we see? 1.6 million. That's amazing. That's crazy. And it's because of everything I'm saying. So that's why I think it's the best opportunity ever in, in real estate for agents, especially, or investors, because we're about to see the market resurge and it's going to be violent. Back in 2008, it took it about five years to get back to go from 4.1 back to 5 million transactions in the country. It's not going to happen this time. We're at 4.2, 4.3. It's not going to take it five years to get back to 5 million transactions in the country. It's going to be a violent knee jerk uh, V shaped recovery when it comes to the number of transactions, just because of the sheer amount of demand and, uh, if we can get in mortgage rates straightened out, but there within lies the problem, right? If they lower mortgage rates, prices shoot through the moon and we're, we're in a really bad place affordability wise. If they raise interest rates, inventory is going to stay incredibly low and that's going to make prices go up, right? So we're, we're in a, we're in a real catch 22 and it's fun. I'm excited to follow and kind of see where it goes. So what was the question? <laughs> Thank you. That was a that was a great answer. Uh, does anyone here want to unmute their mic or put a question in the chat, or I'll go to some that we had submitted via email? All right. One of the ones that we had come in via email was, "How do you generate leads on a low budget?" Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like, you don't have to spend any money to get leads. Right. You could go out and build your entire real estate business um, off free leads. Okay. You can do a lot of things. Number one, social media is free. All right. You can create content every day and DM every single person in your, uh, in your market. Um, you can, uh, you can call for sale by owners for free. You can door knock for free. You can do open houses for free. What else can you do for free? Um, call your sphere. You can go to networking events, meet people. Uh, there's tons of stuff you can do for free. And, and, and honestly, all these leads that I'm telling you are free are the same quality of leads that people spend thousands of dollars for and that, you know, give 35% referrals for. And, uh, so on and so forth. They're, they're the same, they're the same people. Like the leads that you buy are literally the same person you could have met at a gas station, uh, door knocked for sale by owner, went to an open house, all the same people, right? It's people in your market, somebody you DM'd on Instagram and they went back and forth with you and you helped them buy a house. Um, so there's a lot of stuff you can do for free. If you if you're sitting there feeling like you're handcuffed because you don't have money to spend on marketing and leads and stuff, then you're making excuses. So another question was, um, do you 
have any lead generation tools that you recommend? Well, my uh, my favorite is Red X um, because I can get I can target the exact property owners, the exact subdivision I want to do business with, and get their phone number, uh, email address. I can hit them. I can call, text, email, uh, and hit them on social media. They have a they have ad builder that I can run social media ads directly to the property owners on there. Um, and it's all really, really cheap. Like I, you could run your entire business or even an entire team off of like 500 bucks a month and literally have tens of thousands of leads to work with. Did you see Daniel's um, chat a question he put in the chat? He wants to know what are your favorite business podcasts at the moment? And for new agents, what podcast would you recommend? Um, nah, I don't, I don't really listen to anything. Um, I'm too busy researching and reading and making videos myself and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's not a whole lot of them, especially when it comes to real estate. Um, <laughs> and, and there's, there's not a whole lot of good ones <laughs> when you, when you, when, you know, there's not a whole lot of them. And then when you filter out the ones that aren't any good, <laughs> it's really not any, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, like I say, there's not that many get in there and listen to a few and, and, uh, latch on, you know, once you come across somebody you're following, yeah, you know, go, go really deep on them, you know, listen to a lot of their stuff and really, that's what I used to do. Um, I would listen to a lot of, uh, uh who all did I used to listen to? Um, Grant, I listened to a lot of Grant Cardone. Um, who else did I listen to? There were a couple. Um, and I just went really deep. I just listened to like 24 seven, just as much as I could absorb all that I could and, uh, took it with me and, and tried to help, you know, mold my business into, you know, my own, right. And that, that was really the goal is to, to mold your business into your own business, your own style. Um, you know, no, 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 yeah, everybody's business is like a fingerprint, right? Every single business, uh, every agent's business is going to be completely different. There's not, there's, you know, there's not going to be one that's identical to the next. Even if you did the exact same stuff, talk to the exact same people, doesn't matter. People are going to react to you differently, connect with you differently. Um, how you look, your communication style, everything's different. So, um, you know, everybody's business is like a fingerprint and you got to kind of mold yours into, you know, what you feel like is the most efficient machine. Um, you know, I, I sold a hundred properties a year for eight years in a row as a single agent with one assistant. And it, um, I just created this very incredibly efficient machine built around very simple systems. And I think, um, I think a lot of agents overcomplicate the the process and they add too many jobs for themselves. You know, like keeping up with, you know, people's, you know, the, the anniversary of when people bought the home or what people's dogs' birthdays are and when their kids are going to school and stuff like that. You don't realize it, but even if you spend 30 minutes a week on stuff like that that does not matter, that's 26 hours in a year. You know how much damage you can do in 26 hours, but you don't realize it because you think that's just 30 minutes a week. That that time compounded over the course of a year, that 26 hours could be the difference in you doubling your business if you spin it in a more efficient way and, 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 on, and on a more productive uh, actions. Um, so I, I don't know. I think a little different. And you have to think different if you're going to, be a super efficient agent who closes two deals a week for eight years in a row, working like five, 10, 15 hours a week. That's the thing. Um, so anyway, I, I can dive into all, anything you guys want. Anybody want to ask a question or I can go to some more we have in the chat. Hey, hey Ricky, Mark Karen's in Nashville. Yo. Uh, hey, hope you're doing well. Hey, got a question. Uh, so, our business is about uh, oh, 70% um, beer and 
referral clients and probably 30 percent people calling out signs or some type of lead generation and this last chunk of time maybe this last six months or this last year that that 30 percent of leads are going up signs the, the buyers have been you know pretty uh flaky kind of hard to get them to commit um i haven't used the hammered on the buyer's representation agreement but i, I feel i need to do something a little bit better just to get people to commit when they're really not sure that they want to commit any any thoughts or comments on that you're never going to make someone commit that doesn't want to commit and shoving a contract in their face saying sign here is actually going to do the opposite of what you're trying to do it's going to make them say okay i'll go use another agent who's not trying to just get me to sign a contract right so we're in a place in the market right now where there is a lot of uncertainty and uh the general public of course people who are buying you know they're seeing news articles where prices are going to go down and interest rates are high and all this and we're going to wait and kind of see what happens well in my opinion that's kind of a mistake because like for example i'm buying five new construction homes right now to buy and rent out and i can buy these houses in the three to 350 range right now um you know and even as an I, i've got a, a investor rate of six percent later i can refinance those if i want to at a lower rate but i can't buy them at today's prices later and tomorrow's prices this is just my opinion. I'm, another educated guess is going to be higher. Um, I mean, even if prices are 10 to 15% higher over the next year or two, that's a lot. Um, especially since how we're about to hit all time highs as it is. So it's hard to articulate this to the buyers. And, um, you know, all you can do is kind of tell them what you think and then let them do their own thing. You're not going to mat, you're not going to figure out a way, bro to magically get them to buy a house when they don't want to buy a house. Um, and that's honestly not your job. Your job is to help them do whatever it is they're trying to do. So I think, I think what you maybe should understand is that if your business is taking a hit right now, um, but you're still working like a dog and you're still contacting and you're still showing and you're still following up and you're still working the same you're still making the same amount of contacts but you're closing less properties that's just a matter of the market retracting which is incredibly temporary and if you can kind of stop trying to close deals and start trying to just connect with these people and try to create lifelong friends and clients out of these buyers who you know let's just say 80 percent of them don't buy right now just think about how massive your business is going to be when we see the resurgence in the market and we go from 4.3 million to 5.3 million transactions. That's going to be violent, by the way. And your business is going to just explode. You know, when things are down, we think they're never going to come up. When they're up, we think they're never going to come down. This is a very temporary moment right here. Uh, there's so much pent up demand. It's not even funny. And uh, I think just give it some time. I think, I think be a little patient um quit you know quit trying to figure out a way to force people into stuff trying to get them to commit um be more of the educator and you know if you start trying to force you're going to lose these clients and they're going to go use another agent when they decide to actually buy so that's my two cents anybody else want to unmute and ask a question so, Kara, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. So, um, so I am a newer agent. I'm one of the lovely ones that happened to join in 2020, just out of coincidence. And um, obviously, the market has changed tremendously over the last couple of years. And because I'm newer, I feel like that gives me a lack of confidence due to a lack of knowledge with how things change and stuff. So I guess my question would be is how or what is the best way to kind of stay on top of things when I don't have tons of transactions coming in since I'm newer and still building um, in order to, like I say, give myself to me, 
um, knowledge is what gives me confidence. And so I, I trying to find those things that, that, that provide that, I guess. So what would you recommend? You just want to stay on top of the market? Well, just in general, I mean, market plus, I, I guess like, I mean, how to do, how to, um, I mean, a part of this too, I think would help if having a mentor maybe, but, um, <clears throat> part of it, I think too, is knowing how to negotiate properly. I, I mean, just kind of all the new agent unknowns. Yeah. So with the market, just watch your MLS hot sheet every day. Right. First thing we do when you get to the, the office or whatever is, is go to your MLS, pull up the hot sheet, new listings, closings, pendings, expireds. You don't have to memorize everything. Just kind of scan through it every day and pay attention. You'll see new listings pop up. You'll see it go pending in a week. You'll see it close in 30 days. And you'll really have your pulse on the market. You'll, you'll start to spit out things, just second nature, that you didn't even know you knew. Things that come in the market, you know, a client will ask you something. You're just going to be like a market expert and you didn't even know it. It happens so fast if you're looking at that hot sheet every day. So that's a good way to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of the market is just take some time to research your local market through the MLS uh, every day. As far as like learning the ins and outs of the business and the cadence of negotiating and writing offers and things like that, it's something that just kind of comes to you over time from doing it, of course. But you do need to have somebody you can kind of go to um, with questions. Uh, I don't know if you've done any deals yet, but, um, you know, EXP should have a, a local mentor from the mentorship program for you that, um, that you can utilize. Um, but I would find somebody that's willing to help and to kind of help you through the first couple deals or whatever that you can kind of lean on for some of that stuff, you know, but I, I wouldn't sweat it too much. I feel like you're putting a little too much weight on all that. I think that if you take a little weight off that and, and, and distribute that weight a, a little over to the, Hey, I'm just want to help people. Cause like when I walk into a listing appointment, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm a high D so I don't, I don't do listing presentations. I, uh, you know, I don't have anything prepared. I have the comps and you know, maybe I glanced at them. I don't, I didn't have, I don't have anything memorized. I don't really know anything. Um, but I go in here with complete confidence that I don't care about all that. What I do care about is, you know, why is this, you know, homeowner thinking about selling, right? I want to understand the backstory and I want to put together a plan to help that, that, homeowner through whatever it is they're trying to do. See, people don't just wake up one day and say, I want to sell a property for no reason. You know, there's something going on in their life. Their mom died, their kids went to college, they lost a job, they had a baby. Something's happening here. The transaction is kind of a byproduct of something happening in their life. And so I really want to understand what's happening in their life that's causing them to make this decision. Because as I said, the transaction is kind of like something just on the side. That transaction is just to help them get to the next chapter of their life or whatever. Even if it's an investment property, whatever it is, there's a reason behind it. And that's what I got to find out. And that's all I care about. I don't care about all this other stuff, you know, the market and um, how to negotiate. I mean, I'll tell you how to negotiate. You know, you, 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 you get the listing and when you get an offer, you say, here's the offer. All right. And how do you want to respond? They tell you how they want to respond. You tell the other agent, here's how my client wants to respond. They give you their response. You give it back to the seller. How, here's what they said about that. How do you want to respond? All right. It, it's, it's not up to you to negotiate. This isn't your property. You know, it's, it's the client's decisions on how they want to respond and what they want to do. Right. So again, I think you're putting a little bit too, not, not that you shouldn't put any weight on it, but just, it sounds like you're putting a little too much weight on those things. And if you can redistribute that weight toward, you know, away from there, still leaving some there, but, but kind of more so leaning on the fact that you're a good person, that you're a hard worker, that people like you, that you want to help people and put more weight behind that, show people who you really are. Um, I think that you'll be in a lot better place. Okay.
Thank you. Anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Hi, I would just like to kind of piggyback off of the last lady's question, um, because I think that for us newer agents, we're kind of more confused on what we should be doing on a daily basis outside of I've done the phone calls, I've done the messaging people on Facebook and Instagram, and it's not necessarily as effective as I would have thought that it would have been. And it's not like I did it just for a little while and I stopped and I didn't give it enough time. I literally didn't get any results from that. And so it was discouraging. So how do you move past that discouragement of reaching out to everybody that you know and still not really getting any leads and then not knowing what to be doing on a daily basis to feel like you're being productive in the real estate world? Did you call people you don't know? Um, I did a little of what they're calling, um, driving for dollars, got a few addresses and called those people, but, uh, never got any, anyone actually interested in selling their property. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing, and this is incredibly common, totally normal. This is very, very, you know, just classic general pretty much happens to every single agent, right? You have a perception in your mind of how hard this business is going to be when you get into the business you're on this high and you know you're this is your own boss you make your own money you set your own schedule you know this is going to be great and you're on this high and then you have people tell you this is going to be hard and you're like oh yeah i know it's going to be hard i'm ready for hard and you have this conception this perception in your mind of how hard this is going to be but what you don't realize is that the reality behind it is that you need to multiply whatever you thought, how hard you thought the business was going to be and multiply that times about 20. And that's actually how hard it's going to be. And when we get in, we have this expectation that, oh, well, if we call everybody we know and we do a few dollar driving for dollars, then we're going to get a deal. But that's not how it works. And just about every agent on this call that is experienced will tell you that Chances are, if you get a deal, you're lucky if you got a deal out of any of that because um, that's just not the reality for anybody. Sometimes people get lucky and they get a deal really quick and that could be dangerous because now they have a misconception of how the business really operates and they kind of feel like it's a little easier than it really is. And I've seen a lot of agents come in and do a quick deal and end up quitting the business within 10 to 12 months because it, they just kind of didn't really work that hard from that point because they thought things were just going to fall in their lap like that first deal did. It's actually a good thing that you did all this and didn't really get a deal because now you're getting a dose of the reality of the business. The thing is, is that it takes a long time for your business to mature. Um, you know, as a new agent, we haven't we haven't planted any seeds. You haven't, uh, you know, developed any relationships. Um, you know, when you go on a listing appointment and you're up against two other agents, and you lose the listing to another one of the two agents, you think, oh, that agent is more, you know, it's more popular. He's uh, more experienced. He, uh, you know, he, he's a great closer, but that's not the case. The, the fact is, is that that agent probably cold called or met them on social media or Zillow or something three years ago. And they've been staying in touch via weekly email, social media, text, phone call, direct mail, whatever. They've been staying in touch very consistently and proved to that seller over the course of time that they are consistent, that they are a full-time agent, that they are here, you know, they're, they're, they're not going anywhere, and that they're professional and knowledgeable. They, they've, they've developed this relationship. And then you go to the listing appointment and you think it's because that person was a great closer. No, you just met the seller. This other agent has been plant has planted the seed with them for three years, and and that relationship has matured, and they still wanted to get a couple other opinions, but at the end of the day, they picked the person that they 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 felt the most comfortable with that has been there the whole time. So you you got to understand as a new agent, you 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 haven't planted any seeds years ago. You just got in the business, and then all these people that you're talking to, there's a lot of these people that aren't going to do business with you until two to three to four to five years down the road. And so you've got to put systems in place that everyone you talk to never forgets who you are. Right? I do it through a weekly email to my entire database on the same day of the week to show dependability, consistency, hard work, determination, professionalism, all the things that they want in an agent. It shows them that 
that's my system where I don't have to worry about home anniversaries and you know all that stuff. They know who I am. They're going to remember me forever. They're going to there's a good chance they're going to call me when they decide to do something. Nevertheless, what I'm getting at here, it, there's so many things to unpack with with your situation. It's way harder than you thought it was going to be. I'm sure you realize that now. Now is the moment where you say, oh, okay, you know what? It is harder than I thought it was going to be, but Ricky can do it, and all these other agents are doing it. So if they can do it, I know I can do it, right? You're not going through anything that none of us on here that has succeeded has went through. So the question is, is can you stomach how hard the business actually is to get going? And can you can you get through that that hard part of the business, which lasts a couple of years to really get your feet under you to get some real momentum in the business to where you're closing deals on a consistent basis? Can you handle that pressure? And that's why a lot of agents quit. Because they can't handle that pressure because it is extremely hard. So first realize that make a decision that, OK, it's hard, but you know what? I'm up for the challenge. I'm in this for the next 30 years. I don't care if it takes two to three to four to five years to get going. I'm going to do this. Then it's like, okay, you've made that decision. Now you're good. Now let's settle into what we need to do day to day, what you said you're having trouble with. That's not hard either. But the thing is, is I don't know your situation, right? I don't know if you're working a full-time job and doing real estate on the side. As a new agent, a lot of new agents are part-time in the beginning, they're working around a schedule. Maybe they have a family with kids, right? Everybody has different schedules and stuff. So what you have to do as a new agent is you have to delegate. You have to basically look at your week and say, okay, I'm going to hundred percent dedicate these hours on these days to building my real estate business. So I'm not going to ask you because, you know, we, 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 they may turn into a long conversation, but but a lot of agents I talk to that are new that have part time, they're doing it part time and stuff. They don't really, they haven't really mapped out. Okay, I'm going to work from three to five on Wednesday, and you know, two to five on Friday. I'm going to dedicate those hours 100 percent to building my real estate business. I'm going to get after it during those hours. Most agents are just kind of like whatever, whenever. Well, if you don't, if you're not dedicating time to your business to build it, you're not going to have a business. So that's the first thing we got to dedicate that. If you're full time, if you actually are working eight hours a day on your real estate business for whatever reason, then it comes down to a couple of things. I can make a really easy, just simple daily routine for you. Okay, if you're working, you know, you know, eight hours a day. Okay, as soon as you you know, sit down at your computer, right? It's eight o'clock. Okay. For the first 15 minutes, you're going to map out your day, go through your emails, your text messages, brainstorm, think of everything you need to think of for the day, put it all on a sheet of paper with your schedule, your to-do list, hot listings you're going after, calls you need to make. Everything's on one sheet of paper. That way you don't have to worry about nothing the rest of the day. You don't even got to think. You know exactly what you got to do, when you got to do it, and, and, and what the goals are for the day. Boom, that's done. 15 minutes. 8.15, study MLS hot sheet for 15 minutes. 8.30, who are we calling today? And why? What's the purpose? What's the script? Where's the numbers? All that stuff. Because by 9 o'clock, I'm dialing. From 9 to 12, I'm making calls. I don't care who you're calling. Sphere for sell by owner, circle prospecting, expireds, internet leads, Zillow leads, Facebook leads, Instagram leads, open house leads, network. I don't care who you're calling, but you better be calling somebody or you're not going to be closing deals. Nine to 12, we're on the phone. After 12, we're going to do all of our marketing, handwritten letters, making our videos, doing our weekly email, direct mail, SEO, blogs, whatever you do. Now, now, this makes things really super simple. If your goal during the calls is to make five new friends a day, if you look at, and, and this is a real study, NAR did a study, okay? The number one reason why people choose a real estate agent is because they had a friend in the business with a great reputation. And it was like 32%. All the other reasons were less than one. What brokers they're with, online, da, 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 all that stuff. The number one reason, the reason just, all the rest of them were non-existent. This one reason was the reason. Friend in the business with the great reputation. What does that tell you? Your job is to make friends in the market, period. So if you can make five new friends a day with property owners in the market, you, you, you spend that nine to 12, that's the whole goal, 
right? Over the course of five years, 250 working days a year, you can have 6,000 friends in the market. If you're doing, if you got 6,000 friends who own property in the market, that's going to weekly email from you on the same day of the week forever. How big do you think your business is? Right? You're the number one agent in your market. And everybody's going to ask you how you did it. You're going to say, oh, I just followed this dude named Rookie in Alabama. And he said, look at MLS every day, put my schedule together, make five new friends a day and do social media after lunch. And guess what? And now I'm a multimillionaire and I'm the number one agent in my market. This stuff is not hard, guys. Really super simple. But I want to go back to the person that asked the question and make sure that I cleared everything up for you and see if you have any follow up questions. Yes, that was a beautiful response. But I do have a few uh, follow up questions. One, what type of content are you putting in your emails? And two, where are you getting phone numbers from of people that you don't know? Go to Red X, R E D X discount. So you can get the discount. Okay, R E D X discount.com. Get Geoleads Plus and Expireds Plus. Geoleads Plus, you can pick out 7,500 property owners of your choice. Pick out the subdivisions. You get their phone numbers and email addresses. With Expireds Plus, go back 10 years worth of expireds, cancels, and withdrawns and have all that expired data for, for years, right? And call them and say, hey, I saw you're trying to sell this house a couple years ago. Whatever happened with that? Boom, they open up and, and have a conversation with you. Brings you to present day, what they're looking to do now, how you can help them. Really super simple stuff. Um, so that's where you find phone numbers. And then the email, if you, so I've been doing my weekly email since 2007. And in 2017, I was literally able to just quit prospecting altogether. That was the first year I made a million bucks. Made a million dollars every year since with zero prospecting, zero social media, zero anything, just doing the weekly email. Um, you guys can go to startmyweeklyemail.com and see all the weekly emails that I've done since November. I have them posted there. And um, there's a link where you can get my template. You can just use the same template and just do the same thing. Just go there and look at all the emails I did, use my template, and just copy what I do. Can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. When you are using the X spheres and the phone numbers that you're getting from these sites, how do you deal with the call list? The what? No call list. See the no call the list? What? The, the what? do not call list. <laughs> the what? <laughs> You're gonna get a lot of people in trouble, Mister Ruby. I didn't say anything. I didn't. I didn't hear. I didn't hear the question. I didn't say a word. Listen, here's the bottom line of the whole thing. I'm not calling to sell somebody's house. I'm calling as think of yourself as a volunteer worker doing community outreach to people in your area to see what it is you can do to help them. I call a property owner. I, uh, uh, you're a real estate agent. I don't want to sell my house. Good. That's not why I'm calling today, sir. I'm calling as a member of the community here to let you know a house did sell around the corner from you and just calling to see how you're doing today, man. See if there's something I could do to help you. I'm not trying to do a deal with you today. I'm trying to see if there's something I can do. I don't care about what I can't do for you. Let's talk about what you do need. Right? So I'm not calling to solicit. I'm not calling to sell. I'm not calling, trying to call on a list. I'm not asking them if they thought about selling. I'm not calling to present a rental property to them. I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm calling as a friend, right? A member of the same community they're, they live in to see how they're doing. See if I can connect with them. See if there's something I could do to help them. Yeah, it's more of a survey uh, kind of call, which, by the way, is totally legal even for do not call, to do a survey. Who was trying to ask a question at the same time Kim was? I think someone else had a question. I have a question. This is Fonda Hatmaker out of Manchester, Tennessee. Hi, Ricky. How are you? Hey, doing good. How you doing, Fonda? I I'm love that name. F-H-O-N-D-A. Yeah, I have Baker. sisters named Shonda and Rhonda, so I'm the Fonda. <laughs> Beautiful. So, Ricky, what we're seeing is, um, like, 
sellers have expectations of it flying off the market still and and we're not there yet so how do you communicate with them just to keep them you know in your raw raw or your cheerleading and and just let them know i do set expectations of hey it's a um it's a different market now we're looking at 30 60 90 days depending on their price range so how do you deal with that right now as far as if they're already listed with me how to keep them engaged and yes, happy sir. with how things are going or to get the listing pre-listing no to you've already got the listing but mm -hmm. you want them to still be your raw raw even though their house has been listed for uh 35 days well the market gives us data um even no showings is data right um and so all, all we can do is give them the data we're not you know we're not the uh we're not fonda hat maker the rainmaker here we we um you know we we all we do is educate um and try to help Okay. So, you know, I, I contact, if I'm not talking to my seller every day or week because we're showing the property and I have to talk to them on a regular basis anyway, if it's one of those sellers I never really talk to for whatever reasons, I'm at least going to talk to them every other week, give them an update on what's happening with their property, um, you know, on the market with the feedback from any buyers that have looked at it, how many showings we've had, and also anything that's changed in that subdivision or condo complex since we listed it or since last time we talked to them you know so like if there was another one listed it went under contract hey this one this one went pending remember that house we talked about that was on the market we were kind of competing with it went pending you know and you can kind of compare that house to this house and you know have those conversations with them but it's kind of like you're you're you, you both are detectives it's it you know like when a house isn't selling it's kind of like you're both detectives you are kind of a detective partner with um with the seller trying to figure this thing out you know why hasn't it sold what do we need to do to get it sold you know let's look at these properties and how this happened and days on the market over here and price per square foot and this one had a upstairs and this one was a better view and you know all those things so i think it's a matter i think the raw raw comes from the fact that you're not shying away from the fact that it hasn't sold yet that you're kind of hitting it head on you're you're happy to call them and talk to them about it and see if they want to make any changes um if they're good with it if it if it you know if it hasn't been shown at all and they're good with how things are going they're happy with the price they're happy with you they're happy with no showings great let's keep going like it is if they're not happy with that it's like okay well we need to make an adjustment because it's not being shown at this price you know, when you got properties in the same neighborhood that are selling, their price is a little lower. You know, it's it's a very price sensitive market right now. You know, if you're off by ten thousand, literally ten thousand dollars, that could be the difference in it sitting on the market and not selling and selling in literally a day. I've seen it over and over again. So I don't know. Um, every seller is different, you know. So I think um, filling them out, seeing how they feel and just trying to guide them best you can and help them do what they want to do being really honest with them too thank you and uh it, it was like a miracle i had this um listing it went expired we relisted same price we never dropped the price a month and a half into the new listing just yesterday i got five offers on that that property there and i yeah. was like what just happened and it i think it's because we weren't reducing reducing we had it priced right it was a specialty property uh and it was showing you know periodically and then we had like eight showings and got five offers on it so i think that if it's priced right you kind of stick to your guns and and don't reduce art do I, you think that ricky I, I, yeah i I think it depends on the seller. Um, I don't want to tell the seller not to reduce if they want to reduce because, you know, if it if, if I tell them to do something against what they want to do and then it doesn't work out, then they're going to say, hey, you know, they're going to kind of blame it on me. I, I want to help them do whatever it is. they. I want to go whatever direction they want to go with it. Um, but but on the flip side, I, I, I the mar for me, I have to look at your specific market, but prices are going up, not down. So if something's a little overpriced today, it's probably going to be the right price tomorrow. 
Um, so having a little patience, I think, will go a long way with some of this. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I got time for one more, ladies and gentlemen. Rebecca, did you have your hand up? I did. What's your question? Well, it was more of a, a comment um, in regards to how you started this meeting that uh, you were an investor and that you buy and hold, et cetera. So I would love to start fostering a relationship, see if there's anything that we can possibly do to dance together and do commercial and residential here in Tennessee. If you have multifamily, you know, um, apartment complexes and stuff, um, feel free to send me any of those deals. I'll evaluate them and decide if it's something we want to go after. Ricky, what was that email? I'm sorry, what was the website address that you gave out for your weekly emails? Of some, some people didn't catch that. Um, it's called um, startmyweeklyemail.com. Gotcha. Okay. Putting that in the chat. Okay. Um, Ricky, thank you so, so much for your time um, this morning. Uh, it's been a pleasure, as always, to have you in, and we're so grateful. Hey, the pleasure is all mine, guys. Thank you so much, and I hope um, I hope you got something out of it, and you can take back to your business and really crush it. Let me know if um, there's anything I can ever do to help any of you. Just reach out on um, Workplace is a good place um, to to try to catch me or Instagram, of course. So, no, I, I appreciate. Um, I'm honored that you guys would have me.